Kansas City to New York City, from planet Earth to extraterrestrial life in space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Switch is on. Mother I'm going to shoot you in the face. Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dating for a long time. You are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast. The Switch is on Battleline Podcast. I am Ian Scotto, and for this episode, we compiled a very special best of episode. Basically, after 260 plus episodes doing this show since 2019, we've had some extraordinary guests on. Hopefully, they've inspired you. They've given you something to really think about and, and incorporate into your own life. That, that's why we do this. But what is unfortunate is that Three of the guests we've had on since starting this show have passed away, and many of you have heard the episodes, but many of you have not, and I, I really think it's important to honor these guys who we lost, and that is none other than Robert W. Allen, that was most recently uh, Army veteran, Blackwater uh, contractor, Vincent Speranza, World War II veteran, and John Bartolo, who many of you know from the gun industry, also had his own podcast based out of Las Vegas. It was an honor to have all of these guys on, so I wanted to revisit what we did with them. But before we do, Bubs Naturals has been on board with us since basically the beginning of this show, and Glenn Doherty is a guy that we also honor since starting this show, a guy who served as a contractor with Chris in Benghazi, Libya, also a guy I briefly met before his passing away. Bubs Naturals gives back, helping yourself and helping others go hand in hand. That's how they see it. And that's why 10% of all profits always go to charity. And that's the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which helps military families, guys in the special operations communities, families. Uh, they've done stuff with scholarships and all different types of things that are Really, really honorable. So Bub was an adventure seeker, a river guide, skier, Ironman competitor, fitness fanatic, chef, gardener, handyman, and epic storyteller. Bub was a national hero, a Navy SEAL who saved lives, was always the life of the party, and became a best friend to all who knew him. That spirit lives within each of us. That's how Bub's Naturals was born. And their supplements are top-notch, guys. Their collagen protein is single-sourced, grass-fed cowhide. That's all that you're getting in there. No other crap uh, blended into the ingredients. It's just it's an incredible product. There are so many benefits of collagen that you can look up. And I have been hooked on Hydrate or Die. That is the best hydration packet out there on the market. You're not getting all that sugar in your body because you're getting coconut water. You're getting electrolytes without all the added crap. So you could check that out, the MCT oil powder, the Fountain of Youth formula. It's all available at bubsnaturals.com. Just use the promo code BATTLELINE and you're going to get 20% off your first order. Uh, the link to that is in the description, but once again, bubsnaturals.com, promo code BATTLELINE. So let's kick this off with a guy who was one of Chris Peranto's best friends and made a great impression on us uh, coming on for episode 135, telling some amazing stories. This is him telling us some of that, uh, including his protecting Ambassador Stevens prior to what happened in Benghazi, and gives you some insight into who Ambassador Stevens was. So this is Robert W. Howen, rest in peace, great guy, and you are greatly missed. When I read the books, all the movie, and all the research mm -hmm. I've done, all the people that I talked to, was that Ambassador Stevens was getting on the phone requesting extra security. Uh, he he actually was requesting his team back. He had a, when you watch the movie, if you do watch 13 Hours, and it is very accurate, it is. I mean, there's some sensationalism as far as RPGs and 40 millimeters. They don't, you don't see vapor trails and all that. People, you got to see that. If you really want to see what it's like in war, you will walk out with Tourette's because all you'll see is explosions everywhere. But as far as, 
him, uh, he had that jock team where it says joint special operations team, JSOC team repositioning to forward base. That was his actual security team that he had in Tripoli 24 seven. They were part of the 10th special forces group. They were the, see, they were the SIF team commanders of the Sherman's force. And for some reason, when he came to Tripoli, you'd have to ask Hillary, ask Patrick Kennedy, ask Charlene Lamb, ask Petraeus, ask our chief. I don't know why ask the chief of station there in the agency. They pulled that team before he came to Benghazi. That's why all of us were like, yeah, when, when we heard that he was coming to Benghazi and we're like, well, he's got his own security detail. You know, the movie, I was, I was like, hey, he's got his own security. Why the fuck does he need us? Because I worked in Tripoli. I knew those guys and they were pipe hitters. The SIF team, when you're in special forces and you have, you're have you on a SIF team, you are top level door kick and direct action. You are, you've, you've reached a, a certain level to be in a, on an OG, uh, ODA and if you're on a SIF team. And they said, no, they pulled a SIF team. And to my mind, I'll, Rob, I'll be honest with you. In my mind, I was, well, fucking State Department, <laughs> fucking shit up again. Yeah, no, and that's what I looked at because when when they when I read the part about him requesting extra security, the first thing I thought, Tonto, the man's not scary. He no. he's he's no. done his time in the trenches. He's a Ford service officer. He knows when shit's about to go sideways. And, he, everything and, else. He, and he speaks. He's fluent, completely fluent Arabic. Mm-hmm. He's, he knows what people are saying behind his back. He always yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah. So when he requested security, I was like, okay, that right there. Brother, I'm not the best intel analyst out there, but yeah, I'd call that a fucking indicator. Okay, whenever the the the, the ambassador's requesting extra security, something's on his mind because these guys don't act scarier. They don't jump for no reason. Something not the foreign service indication. officers. No, not guys that have come from the foreign service officer and actually have have done the done the the homework enough that now they've they've speak the language. Mm-hmm. When I've met those kind of a diplomats that actually have him have become so immersed in the job, which is a good thing. We need those kind of guys mm-hmm. that they actually speak speak language. They want to be out there shaking hands because they know that's what it is. That's the diplomatic part of it. Yeah. And he was requesting extra security. Well, he was requesting his security team back. He's like, give me my guys back. And Mm -hmm. DOD said, yes, actually department of defense says, yeah, we'll give them back to you. And state department stopped it. So whatever you want to say about, and I don't, I I don't give a shit left, right, Democrat, Republican, state department stopped. State Mm -hmm. why? We will never know until somebody gets the balls to stand up and say, this is why I have my ideas. But I'm glad you asked that because you saw the same thing I saw in Bashar Stevens. He, he, he loved he loved the Middle East. He really did. I think he really was a, a patriot in the fact that he really did feel like we could we could help feel, fix a lot of those problems there. But, you know, I go, you, you and you know, as good as I do, that a dictator is a dictator for a reason and overthrowing oh, dictators. That doesn't help. I think I hopefully we've learned that by now. And but, it, but we it, haven't. But we have but we have it. Yeah, clearly. What's your, what's, your, what's your mindset? I mean, you spent more time just in Israel. What's your what's your opinion on that? And getting away a little bit from Ambassador Stevens, but you have more time within DOD and State Department than I do. So without getting yourself in trouble, because I want you to make your own six, dude. I don't want <laughs> but um uh, you know, uh, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your, what's your opinion uh, on that? I mean, what, I, I don't think we should ever go nation build ever again. I don't think that's it. When somebody attacks us, we go kill them. We, we hammer the shit out of them. And then we say, okay, don't touch us anymore. We're going back home. Here's your country back. But what's your opinion yeah. on that? Truth, truthfully, Tom, I got to be a little bit cautious on that one because I, I do want to prepare civil affairs for the military. Uh, I'll just say that right. <laughs> the military, we're a sledgehammer. And that's that's what we need to be. We need to be a sledgehammer. And I I, I see some of this stuff, and I understand. Um, and I'm going to kind of segue into something. The February 17th sure. guys or the guys that were in your yeah. Let's get yeah. into that. Yeah. Always letting somebody else take over. That's a double edged sword. Yeah. I think there's yeah. times where we need to let these guys take over and do their thing. And, and and like when I was in Iraq last time, the the Kurds were doing phenomenal. I mean, Man, they are awesome. Dude, They're to me the bro, best I'll tell you right now, Tonto, the, the Kurds are the proverbial. Fuck around and come up to reveal and find out. They do not tolerate shit from nobody. But but they also set the example. The Kurds, to me, set the example of how different ethnicities and religions can coexist together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because you have the Christians there. You have the the, uh, Yazidis around. I know know Mm -hmm. there are caste systems. They're just like uh, people think we have discrimination here or caste. Go overseas. You have no idea. But still... They make it. They make it work because you can have. How can you? You have an ice skating rink downtown at a mall in Erbil. Why just 
you know, 30 miles, 60 miles down the road towards Kirkuk, you've got the Peshmerga fighting back fucking ISIS. Oh, yeah. Dude, it's, I, it's, I tell you, I tell you it's Tonto. I was like, I feel safer or felt safer walking around our beal than I do as a fucking policeman in New Orleans sometimes. I, you did. You did. Barzani, nobody's got Barzani rules. Hey, you, Barzani's the man and Talibani's mm-hmm. the man in Suleimania. And, and you do. You, you the, the crime is there, the petty crime there. But even them, they, they're not dumb enough when they see something that doesn't look heard. Yeah, they, they know there, there's enough agents and security from every walk of life going around Kurdistan that, that they know like, dude, let's leave them alone. Where, you know, in Lahore, they had to learn out the hard way with uh, when when one of our GRS guys, tra- they tried to rob him when they tried to rob uh, Tombstone. Tombstone. And zipped them up. That was it. Rob was there. Rob, actually, we put Tombstone through GRS training. Yeah. Tombstone was one Tombstone. of our TDC guys. I was giving him shit, and, uh, Okay. And um, <laughs> I was giving him shit. I was like, bro, you didn't get sh- ass raped in a Pakistani prison, did you? I mean, I was fucking with him back. <laughs> yeah, he, he pro- I mean, I, we can go that route. That's an SS thing. No, I'm kidding, guys. I am just giving you long tabber shit. I'm just kidding. I love all y'all. And Tombstone, that dude could shoot, man. I mean, I, well, if you're, that, that's the wrong guy you want to try to rob that has a pistol. I just, yeah, that, that's, that's another one. Called called fuck around and find out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, hey, I, I want to make sure that, ahead, that yeah. we hit on this because, I mean, we we touched on the Ambassador Steve and stuff in Jerusalem. But I think for this audience, I, I said it during the intro with Chris, like there's members of this audience who are truly like Benghazi historians. They love learning about every single person that was there. There's a guy who follows us on Twitter at Benghazi Notes, and he he'll do the whole timeline of what happened on what day at what time. And, and these guys just. I mean, for Chris, it's different because you were there, but I think people are fascinated with what went down and the personalities the same way that they are with the Kennedy assassination or what happened at Ruby Ridge or what happened at Waco, Texas. So I'm just wondering, do you have any story about Ambassador Stevens that you think this audience would get something out of? Uh, again, at the end of the day, he he was an honorable man. He was a man. He, he was a man of character. He believed in what he was doing. And again, the the main thing is that he wasn't scary. I mean, that, that he would not jump. I mean, that's just not his thing. Um, now, I will make you laugh. I got my ass chewed out by him one time because I was doing advance work and we, we I did the site survey and everything else and I just didn't like where we were at. And I said, look, they got an underground garage. I said, I feel more comfortable in the garage than I do anywhere else because that gets us out of the view. So he came down there and as he was coming up, I was doing my whole, hold my arm out for the vehicle to arrive yeah. and everything else and, hey, sir, come with me, please. And as I was get, holding my arm out, two Palestinians approached me. So they were walking up to the motorcade. Tonto's eyebrows raising. I mean, we all see what's going on. My eyebrows. I start yeah. puppy dog ears come up, and I start looking at it, feel the hair on the neck. And I walk up, and I get between them and the motorcade because I knocked on the window. I told the agent in charge, eyes, I got these guys. I walked up and got between these guys and the ambassador. The agent star started walking him in. So he walked him inside, and I keep doing it, laid my body, stay in between those two guys and the ambassador and um, come to find out the the ambassador or ambassador Stevenson caught me at, back at um, the consulate general's office. He goes, Hey man, if they want to walk up to me, you, you gotta, you gotta let them go. And I was like, well, sir, I said, I hope you understand from my standpoint, what we're doing and what's going on. And he goes, yeah, I understand. He goes, but also keep in mind what I'm doing here. I said, sir, I totally understand. So I went and talked to my detail leader, another great guy. He goes, Hey, at the end of the day, the ambassador is the boss. I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, but you, you made you made a good call because at the end of the day, you don't want another coast is what we had at, oh. at, Chap- at, at, at Chapman with our GRS guys. And for anybody that don't, if you want, if you don't want to know or read about what happened to coast, the GRS guys watch Zero Dark Thirty and watch the beginning of it. That's GRS. And that was the chief telling the security guys to not do their security protocols because he didn't want to offend the devil, which turned out to be a double agent, blew himself up, killed uh, two GRS, uh, killed two GRS guys, killed several CIA officers. Well, they, course, you know, they so. tried to hang that on um, on the static guys. Yeah, yeah, I, and that was horseshit. Yep. And, yeah, and, and you know what? I, I also think <laughs> being in Israel too, and and I I went to Israel back in uh, 04, I think you know I just mentioned earlier just as a topic of of the people are fascinated by the Kennedy assassination. I think in America the attitude is that could never happen today. It was so long ago. But I think fresher in the minds of people in Israel was the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, which was just in the 90s. And I know he was like such a, you know, su- such a big figure there. And when I was in Israel, I got to see, you know, where he was assassinated mm-hmm. by, you know, Israeli extremists. And, and I think that probably is on your mind, too, of uh, 
of, yeah, you, you could be shot and killed at any time. And it's my responsibility. Yeah, the, the tough part is that back then, Arafat was still alive. So yeah. There, there was a lot of tension in the air. I mean, I, I, I got to be honest with you. I was more worried about getting clipped by an Israeli than I was a Palestinian. Really? I mean, these guys were on edge. I mean, I, I would look up and every once in a while, I mean, I see the glint off a scope on a rifle. I mean, it's like, it, you know, as well as I do. I mean, that's a lonely feeling in the world. And yeah. you yeah. see it coming from towers and everything else. And then going back to when, when the when the brothers got killed, uh, uh, Cheese, Mark, and John, they got clipped. Uh, it was like, <laughs> come to find out, the Israelis had did a raid in the area utilizing black fucking Suburbans. And, so and they were targeting like, come yeah. on, guys. I mean, at least tell us. But nobody was telling us what was going on. Well, and so we sent our guys saying. down there, and that was it. I mean, it's like, now whether, I'm not going to say correlation proves causation or anything like that, but it's enough to raise an eyebrow. Well, it does. The correlation does cause causation, or at least correlation causes you to be a big fucking target. Because I, th- I just tell people they're not the terrorists are not dumb. Our enemies are not dumb. What would we do if we said, well, what did they look like when they came in? Well, and we have the ability and also the uh, the, the the way to desensitize ourselves to everything that you know we're just going to kill everything. Well, what would we do? We're going to target something that looks similar to what targeted us. Probably not going to be the same people, maybe, but regardless, we're going to kill somebody and oh, yeah. maybe we get the same person. I, it, but uh, that was, you know, back then and, you know, maybe go into it a little bit back then, even when we came in, in, in the two thousands state department, the, the, the ability to pass on information was not good. No, Intel was I mean, not, we, we, didn't we never whole, knew anything. We didn't have the whole talks and we didn't have like the <clears throat> Intel fusion cells and all that other stuff. I mean, literally what we're doing in Jerusalem, I mean, we build our own packages. So, I mean, we build our own building, our site surveys and everything else. And then um, by the time I got back to um, Iraq and started seeing what was going on and seeing how things were working, I mean, you, you had the whole freaking talk set up, DOD Coordination Department of State, RSOs, helicopters. I mean, just freaking everything you could need. And and I, I got to be, I'll be perfectly honest with you, Tonto. One of the one things that I didn't do that I wanted, that's a lot. Two of the things that I had the opportunity to do and I didn't get a chance to do it. I was recruited for car size detail and I was recruited for Brimmer's detail. And I okay. didn't get, I, I was called up by the military in 0405. So I didn't get a chance to do that. And th- those were two ones. Those, those were also two of the, the, the high profile details, including yeah. Israel and everything else. But I got recruited by Gary Jackson at Blackwater. And oh, I, yeah. made laugh, dude. I, I was recruited for, I, I saw the old emails. I was recruited for DSS class two. You would have been right after me. You coming right. You would have been. We would have been punching out where you were coming in. And, yeah, uh, bro. I mean, that, yeah, that's I, I, I wanted. I wanted to do that one so bad. But at, at the end of the day, I mean, I've had a great experience <laughs> and a great life. But and that, those were the, those were those were the two, especially Bremer. Bremer would have been fun. Well, and that, that's where they were really. They did perfect, and and uh, you know, hands down to the Blackwater guys on that detail, the Dyncore guys on the Carzy detail. They really did perfect PSD throughout those two details i mean mean, it has changed and it's going to morph because our enemies change and their tactics change but if you want to go to the the playbook of how to do big team psd it's karzai and bremer and and yeah i was very blessed to work with those guys and then also work on on the state department details after work on the james jeffries detail the charge day affairs Uh, tell me though i wanted your opinion you know you what well first i want to know first how many guys did you have on Ambassador Stevens' detail in, his, in, in Israel. What, what, what size was the team? And I, I, I kind of have an idea, but I want the listeners out there to know. So when we talk about Libya, you can see that there was something else going on that was shadier and shit. There was fuckery afoot, definitely in in, in Benghazi with with uh, in Stevens. But set the tone. How many people did you well, have? I'm assuming a lot, but well, that not actually quite to the contrary, dude. There, there was well. Let me rephrase. Broken down into the ambassador. Detail and his, and his teams, his, his assets, and, his team. he and then we had the consulate general's detail and a few other ones. But for the ambassador, it was me and a guy named Miles. We did the advance, we had an interpreter, so we we're going into um Jerusalem or going into um West Bank, Ramallah, Jericho, places like that. And then um, we also had the RSO, and then we yeah. had three other guys that were doing we were doing a two vehicle configuration i mean nothing no, no, so you, no, had, you no. had enough yeah you had enough teams to do that's i mean that's that's still more than what he <laughs> yeah no i mean no, no the grs guys i mean you guys were two-man souls in fucking indian country i mean y'all y'all were out there y'all y'all were out there i mean we we had a small team but what, what you guys were doing was was in indian country and then again now if you got into to karzai 
when you're looking at the K diamond, when you got 11 people walking around somebody, or you're going into three vehicle motorcades, you got helicopter assets, you got everything. And then same thing with Bremer. I mean, you, you literally got the DOD on call on whenever you need anything, right. quick reaction for it, counter assault teams. I mean, they were even running dummy motorcades. I mean, they were, I mean, not, yeah. not getting too yeah. much into OPSEC. I mean, there was a lot of shit going on, dude, uh, when they'd run these motorcades. So it, it, our teams were relatively small, but we kept a low profile. I mean, for, for us, I'm in Jerusalem. We weren't running around in black freaking suburbans. I mean, hauling ass through the city and everything else. I mean, we had a little BMW and we had a little Toyota Land Cruiser and that was us, dude. That was us doing the dance. You got a, did you have four, at least we had an RSO, which was awesome, which the RSO was the agent in charge or he was your Yeah, he was, the AIC was, was good dudes. Yeah. So it was about six of us doing the AMBO's detail. And there was actually four with them at the time. And QRF, did you any QRF elements, State Department that they designated for, for all the teams or just his team? If we got clipped, we had some of the old school, old, old school GRS yep. guys from back in the day. And yep. then uh, we also had um, – uh, we had great rapport with the Israeli police, great rapport with the Israelis in case something happened and they needed to go down there and get us. But at the end of the day, dude, I I, I never uh, – there was one pal sitting that made me nervous when we had to go see him, uh, and it was his, his security guard. But he – this dude – Tonto, you'll laugh, brother. This dude was about a six-foot-five Palestinian, about 300 pounds. He wore the purple uh, camouflage, and we nicknamed him the Purple People Leader. I mean, this was probably one of the biggest dudes I've ever seen in my life, bro. I mean, he played lineman in the NFL. And I told my boss, I said, he didn't, he blinks at me, I'm going to shoot him. He even looks at me. And he goes, no, don't kill him. <laughs> like, I'm just telling you, bro. But no, I mean, it was, it was, um, we, we had the, all the support we need, but we also had a great rapport. I mean, we were talking yeah. to people, we were friendly with people. Um, Dude, I could go down there and any place in Jericho, Bethlehem, any place like that. The first thing people do is give me food. Here, come drink tea. Here's food and everything else. Come out. Shawarma, falafel. I mean, yeah, falafels. Uh, I mean, it, it was good. And um, again, you still want to grip and grin, shake hands, smile and everything. But at the end of the day, you were there. You were there in a security sure. capacity. The only yeah. thing I can honestly say I really didn't like is we never carried long guns. We, we couldn't carry I, long guns. I, yeah, and that's, that's the, in Israel. It, it, Israel is supposed to be our, and I do believe they are our, our, our friends. Mm-hmm. I know us on the ground, we, we get, we get fight. That's just, that's an arrogant bravado. Mm-hmm. There's Israeli women on the ground. Yeah, it's, it's competing. It's the stupid alpha maleness that goes on. Uh, but yeah, I, I could, I could see that as well because it's Israel. It isn't Iraq. It isn't, mm-hmm. we're not, there's, we're supposed to be working in this fight together. Mm-hmm. And in the end of the day, I, and I don't know your opinion at the end of the, the day, I thought we were, Granted, you still have guys getting in fights going out with Israelis at night because you're going to a bar and you're American and you're you're an outsider that shouldn't be here picking up on Israeli women. So we're going to fight. And then you get and then it's our fault, too, because guys are getting drunk and just being obnoxious and just being shitheads. But after they, a while, they, they, we hung out at a couple bars and they one it took, it took a while for us to be accepted. But once we were once people knew who we were and well, let me rephrase that, not knew who we are but knew what was going on and knew that we weren't any issues or anything like that became friendly because we were there for a year. I mean, we, we were yeah. just, they, we just became, oh, yeah. that was your contracts were a year long. They were a year mm-hmm. long at that time. Wow. wow. That is a long time. What, yeah. what, 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 what were you on 90 on 30 off or not? We, we, we could do a year or we could do breaks and come in and come back. That contract went on with DynCorp for a few years. Cause I was going to go back after Iraq and I was already told I'd get picked back up. And then um, that's when MVM hit me up. Oh, and they okay. said, hey, are you interested in the OGA program? I said, sure, why not? And then um, I think, I can't remember the lady's name from BW reached out to me. She goes, I hey, know. we want you to come up. Gloria Scheidels. Oh, Gloria. Oh, yeah. Gloria she, I think she runs me. Guns and Ammo Magazine now. Or she used to, or she oh, wow. left mm-hmm. it for a while. Yeah, Gloria's nice. She's a nice lady. She's she, lady. She, she was she, the one that recruited me for the, pro, for <laughs> the OGA program. All right, once again, kicking that off, that was Robert W. Allen from episode 135, if you want to go back in the archives and check that full episode out. Before we continue, Fort Scott Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact, their trademark, TUI, and soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military-grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, 
but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, but you're going to get the best deal through us when you go to fsm.com and use the exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast. That's fsm.com. Promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off. Link to that is in the description. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and the BATTLELINE podcast. We also have the best night vision sponsor out there, none other than Photonis Defense. Now you can have the superpower to see in the dark with the Viper Binocular Night Vision System by Photonis Defense, the global leader in night vision solutions, providing more high-quality night vision capabilities than anyone. Military, law enforcement, and public safety end users utilize Photonis Defense solutions to give them the edge at night in tactical situations and rescue operations. Hunters, shooters, boaters, and enthusiasts can rely on the Photonis Defense Viper Binocular to become masters of darkness. The new Viper Binocular system carries the same features and benefits as the Photonis Defense Viper Monocular with a ruggedized body and harnesses the power of the Echo Intensifier tubes, giving you sharper images, reduced halo, and industry-leading ultra-fast auto-gating across the range of dynamic operating conditions. Visit PhotonisDefense.com for more information, P-H-O-T-O-N-I-S Defense.com for more, or look for Photonis Defense product options from your night vision dealer. This next guest was highly respected in the gun industry, um, was also very controversial, as you'll hear from this clip. He had no problem, uh, you know, given his opinion on people in the gun industry that maybe he wasn't the most fond of. But I don't want people to think it was all negative because we've also had people on since then, like John Keyes from Guns Out, and they've said that John Bartolo did tremendous things to help their career and their channel from the early days. So uh, I, I think I uh, it resonates with me to some extent. I'm always going to give you an honest opinion. They're they're the type of people who come on the podcast and everyone is great and everything. Everyone is awesome. Uh, I'm I'm not the biggest fan of that. I don't, I don't like bullshitters. And John Bartolo definitely was not a bullshitter. Uh, and. I I wish I could have gone on his podcast. He had the coolest studio in in Las Vegas. Would have loved to have done it. He invited us on, but it just didn't never really panned out. And pretty shortly after he passed away. So you are greatly missed, John. This is from episode 115. John Bartolo talking about the gun industry unfiltered. And it's an honor, Chris, to share my story with you guys, uh, both you and Ian. You know, I had the the opportunity very early on in the gun industry to participate in social media as it was starting to come to fruition and it was starting to bubble over. I got out of college at that ripe time, 2004, uh, you know, when everything was kind of starting to come to be. Facebook was still a glint in the eye. Instagram was ways away. So I I was kind of, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So like everybody else, I started coaching football at my local high school and I You know, I went to the police academy. I graduated Melita 8 up in uh, Topsfield, Massachusetts, had the option of uh, work in reserve and part time. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I had this awesome opportunity with brands like Breakthrough Clean and Enforced Weapon Lights as they were kind of coming online. And they were all figuring out what this social media thing was to participate in some of the comms and PR with all those brands. And my background, you know, having the education I had in business lended to that. So along the way, I started to create this business, which led to me having the opportunity to become a CEO. I ended up moving to Montana. I worked wow. uh, part time there as a, 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 as a with their reserve program and had the opportunity to kind of see the world from both sides, Chris, sure. and, and really got to understand you know, what the instructors on the range go through on a day-to-day basis, but also be able to translate that to some of the corporate guys that were kind of slow, as we all know, in the gun business. And I got enough enemies at the NSSF (laughs) and NRA and some friends, but we all know we were very slow to get to a lot of these spaces. It took a very long time for people to, to start to understand what marketing was in the firearms business. And I think nationally, we still get it incredibly wrong. Yeah. So I wanted to start a show and I and I jumped over some points there. I had 
moved to Las Vegas because I had the opportunity to learn the import export game from an AK company. So I got okay. to come out here for a year. So I had bounced around the industry and built up this, this giant breadth of knowledge and kind of what I like to tell everybody is I got the best on the job training anybody could ask for because we didn't know where it was all going and what was going to happen. So as we're starting all these Instagram pages and social media influencing marketing, everything, I had the opportunity to meet some really cool people. Guys like yourself, guys like JJ Ricasa, Max Michelle, yeah. as they were starting out, guys like Tony Sentman out, Real World Technical, Pat McNamara, all these yeah. great dudes that I just had to pinch myself from time to time. And I was like, I'm around all these really cool dudes. Along the way, people started to say to me, geez, you should really do a podcast. You should record some of these phone calls. They're pretty good. I go, well, that's wiretapping, but we can do something <laughs> called a podcast. That may make some sense. And I had, you know, a lot of people know this, don't know this. I had the luxury of working uh, on the Trump campaigns and being a part of the MAGA movement early on. So I had my claws a little differently than everybody in the gun business, as you both know, to have my hands in the political side as well as the mainstream side, as well as the corporate side. So I knew okay. what the button pushers wanted. I could talk to the guys like Chris, guys like Tony Semina, guys like, mm -hmm. you know, all these different guys out there that were doing it on the range, which I clearly wasn't. And I could translate a lot of the language they were using to the executives to say, guys, this is the way it's going. You have to support these guys. And I've always yeah. been an advocate of the instructors and the shooters because I think they're the, the blood of the industry. Oh, yeah. Them and the FFLs, we're lost. And I've yeah. been saying it for a very long time, Ian, as you know, because you follow the podcast, the national media gets the gun debate incredibly wrong. And they totally have the wrong talking points. They have the wrong people at the forefront talking about it. And I had this same conversation with Jack Carr, Chris. Yeah. And Jack and I have talked about it. You know, you cannot put tip of the spear guys like yourself on the national media and say, now we're going to talk about second amendment sure. rights, because what you have to do as a tip of the spear guy is take your hat off and now think like a civilian. And you have to start to think, what does the gun debate have to do? What aggravates me in the whole thing is the FFLs and, and the folks that their dollars are affected by this business, the CEOs, those are the strongest voices that we need in the gun debate without question yeah. to be speaking up but they're afraid and they're afraid of getting canceled and never being able to work anywhere else so they've always relied on the nra and the nra is nowhere to be seen and they don't value media the way that they should because it's right. like, a, like a bear shitting in the woods if we don't yeah. see it or smell it did it happen and and you're right on that i, I jack jack of course jack's a tremendous individual uh, um what what was his uh when you when you t discussed it you know because it is hard for the guys at the tip of the spear to talk about it. I, and I don't want to be out there because the, the, we don't want to be part of the political. I, I don't. I have no, no, no interest in the. I got involved in the political movement for three years and it was probably the worst time of my life. I, I, don't, I want no business in it. Um, but how do you get those guys then, like myself, that don't want to be out there, but we still need to put our voices. Who do we who do we turn to? And a lot of the times the CEOs and the and the and the big companies they don't want to hear from us or, or yeah. it's a, or it's a bravado thing. It's that alpha male thing that you get well, into. It's, right? it's the entire gun industry is a dick measuring contest. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's, spot on. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's who you killed, where you killed them, what you did. It's, it's our, who's, bl who's officer black. We, we've been saying it for years since you started in, since we started in 2002 working, it's that old, who's ops are blacker than my, my ops are blacker than your ops, your ops are blacker than mine. So who's got the blackest ops out there. And it's still the same. And it's, and it's bullshit. And you and I both know, Chris, that is not, you can't market to that. No. no. But, but owners get obsessed with it. I, I say it all the time on the show. Every gun, gun company's favorite line when you walk by their booth, Navy SEALs are like. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and we're all like, Navy SEALs can look at whatever the fuck they want. So, so I think for years that they, they've got away with this type of approach towards marketing and undervaluing a lot of the assets yeah. that are out there and undervaluing really the production that I think they're starting to understand it. You see brands like Six Hour starting to release the FCUs, making the trigger, the serialized component. Right, Them yeah. starting to get into experiential marketing. Guys like Tom Taylor stepping to the forefront, mm -hmm. saying we need to do things like this, or we need to do things like that. And we need to start to look at this stuff. CMMG is launching NFTs yeah. and they're doing, they're diving in. I think if a lot of these brands don't start to look at things like the metaverse, don't start to look at things like, like, like experiential marketing and building out something that's special to and unique to their brand, yeah. 
I yeah. think they're going to miss the boat. And whether you decide to use a, a, a shooting experience or you decide to host a concert, it doesn't matter what it is, but you have to start to take steps towards coveting those that respect and want to work with your brand while at the same time building yeah. an experience. Look at brands like First Form that have, that have done a phenomenal job of doing that. You look at brands like Sig that have been moving that way for quite some time. And their whole booth in and of itself was like an individualized experience. I think we really missed the boat nationally and at the show level in terms of what's really important. And what's really important is helping those FFLs continue to stay open to be able to get us the stuff that we need to do the job that we want to do, whether that's selling guns, marketing guns, uh, building more. But we have to understand where all this comes from. It ends with a button pusher somewhere in Epping, New Hampshire, or somewhere in Tennessee that's pushing a button on a machine. The gun industry, and it's no disrespect, is not representative of the tip of the spear. If the Second Amendment went away tomorrow, Navy SEALs would still have guns. If the Second Amendment went away tomorrow, Marines would still have guns. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. why nationally does Tucker Carlson and anybody else continue to say, we have a great spokesperson for the Second Amendment, yeah. and, you know, door gunner so-and-so? I'm not sure what that means. And I do get upset when I start to see representations like that because we're a better and more of an industry, more robust industry than Hickok 45 taking shots down the range. There's more no, to right. it than that. No, and I think right. yeah, we don't do a good job capturing that story. A lot of these FFLs, as you know, Chris, they're family-owned businesses. They're oh, yeah. struggling to get by. They're constantly getting guns pulled from their list, yeah. stuff yeah. taken away from them to sell, and they're getting eaten up by the online. But we need those FFLs. Without those FFLs, we can't transfer guns. And that's yeah. eventually what they want to come after, that and taxing the ammo, which yeah. the ammo debate is a whole nother thing. And, and that, that's another group that just doesn't play well together. And that could control the world if they would just come together because of the, the shortage of toilet paper and ammo. And like everybody else, it blew up. But, but you know, the, just the jealousy between the Smith & Wesson not liking the new companies like a Fort Scott Munition comes up because maybe they're doing something with ammo a little bit different. But instead of working together and said, hey, you know what? Let's, I love your ideas. That's fantastic. It's your shit sucks. My shit's the best. You guys have been around for two years. We've been around for 100. We're not going to figure out and try to work right. this together and get bigger together. And you do see that with some of the, some of the uh, farms companies. Not as much. So you're right. You don't see it as much because, uh, because of the specialization of guns. Just like I said with the SIG, that SIG gun in the back. It's no longer just black rifles. It's, man, we can build something. I mean, look at, I got Tano's toolboxes. I think they're the coolest. And some of them are uglier than shit. I got one that's just disgustingly ugly. But it's like, man, that is mine right there. That is what I want to make something special that's a little different, little off. Yes, you, not it's not for everybody, but it's something that's that's different. And and and, I, and as far as the guns go, if we could continue to do that and make the different, specialized, cool stuff, and not just the standard. Uh, I don't know. HTX is a great no, example. I, I, I agree. I think for yeah. a long time, Chris. I think that the the. Listen, I tell everybody this. Bullet technology has improved far dra more drastically yeah. than gun technology. If you go and you look at the refinement of powders, primers, oh, yeah. on, you've seen tremendous advancements there. I think in our industry, at least, we're in a similar age bracket. I think soft goods has had the largest quantum leap in the industry. Now you can go out and wear pants and you don't have to look like you're retaking Omaha Beach. So you look <laughs> a little bit better and you kind of have, you know, your shit together a little bit. You can put a backpack on and you don't have to look all mauled yeah. out. You know, you don't have to look crazy. So we have made some advancements. And I think the brands are starting to understand brand power. They're starting to understand how to treat influencers. But it's been a long road since 2004 to, to 2022 right. as we kind of come forward. But I agree with you. A lot of the technology in firearms hasn't changed. We got polymer. We have striker fire. SIG finally came around with a great striker fire product in the P series. So they got online. We saw it with SIG in the M and P series. We saw it with obviously Glock going back to 1981, finally yeah. getting the brick to at least have a little bit of shape to it. <laughs> but all of them are starting to kind of come together. And then you still have the Gucci products out there, the Kimbers, yeah. you know, the pearly yeah. grip stuff that people like. And that stuff's all great. And I think we're at a very critical point as an industry as to whether or not we're going to start to stop identifying as hunters, as this, as that, and start to identify as true yeah. Second Amendment supporters and start to put those people to the forefront that can have the conversation. And I'm not saying they all don't cook up in a nice cocktail and make a recipe, yeah. whether you want to put a seal in there or this or that or a Tony Seminon or a Chris, 
you know, or, or whoever, or Ian or John Bartolo, but you have to make the recipe at the national level. You have to get those talking points pushed out. I think we do a, a terrible job of that. I thought when we went for the suppressor law, we should have gone for national reciprocity. Yeah. I think we should go for national reciprocity. That's what we should be after. Ultimately, the gun permit should be just like a driver's license. And I'm an advocate of the gun permit, and I've taken a lot of heat for that because a lot of people want constitutional carry. I always say, whoa, 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 whoa. The instructors, yeah. you can have constitutional carry, but the instructors are my friends and they're near and dear to my heart. And I think you have to feed that vehicle of them instructing and them having the opportunity to teach because that's the blood of the industry. They're the ones that are going to refer people to the local yeah. gun shop. They're, so I see a value in having the instructors like I'm all for a machine gun permit. Sign people up, teach them, coach them, get them prepared and get it to the next level. But, uh, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate of both constitutional carry as well as having a CCW permit, but giving the instructors business because they're my friends and I want to see them succeed. And it's important. And it's important. We've had hunter safety since I was growing up. That shit, there's no change. We shouldn't change that. No, like it's every, a great every, program. Exactly. You should be being taught. Nobody you should just like a driver's license. You're not just give here. Here's your driver's license. Go ahead, head down the road. It's the same thing with a gun. I, I, my opinion, yes, everybody should have the opportunity to carry, but you should be taught the basics and you should be taught the responsibility. And there's plenty of instructors out there that are tremendous. And you're right. And it's not, not just because they're my friends. It's just that this is the right way to do it. If you're going to carry right something that's dangerous. Yes. You need to be taught the right way to do it. Your responsibility and your basic course, just like I was taught when I was 10, my hunter safety. That was the first thing I did. Hunter safety. Here's a gun. Here's how, here's what the, here's the dangerous part. Here's the not dangerous part. Here's the safety. This is what you do with it. Here's your fundamentals. And then start your, start your road down the, the, the firearms industry that way. But it should always be that way. And we both know, Chris and Ian, you know, the, the, the gun community, a lot like the jiu-jitsu community, if somebody came up to you and said, Chris, I want to get a concealed carry permit. I don't have a pot to piss in and a window to throw it out. You're going to say, come to my class next Tuesday. Yeah. We'll yeah. figure it out. It's yeah. not, yeah. there's no barriers of entry, really. It's just yeah. like getting a permit. So I try to explain to people all the time, the instructors, the FFLs, those are the heartbeat of the industry. Yeah. And we need them fed and we need them have to have the opportunity to coach and teach and to be able to push the products and push the, the yeah. experience of shooting. Because without that, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. it, where are we? And it's, you know, a similar problem we run into uh, in the competition shooting world. Uh, no barriers of entry, easy to get in, but they can't figure out how to market that or how to push that out there. And it really creates a slog in our industry. So the instructors, the instructing, like what Max, JJ, and Doug Koning do, sure. that is everything, being able to get out there with pros like that and participate. I just wish the sport could elevate to a level where it could get its its respect. Well, and, well, and it just be looked at as a sport. We, I teach firearms as a sport. To me, it's a complete sport. It reminds me, I, I played football all the way through college and really shooting when I went to the Rangers and then did the other, went to the agency, they were still running around. You were still running around. You're running from point A to point B. Yep. You're doing exercises before you even start to shoot. And then when the real stuff hits the fan, that's a game. I, I, I mean, it, yes, there's another level if you lose, but it's still, to me, it was, man, this is the ultimate game. If we would treat it like a sport, we would push it more as a sport instead of a dis. And I, I, I respect people that say it's a discipline. I, it is. You're right. It's a discipline. But no, this is a sport. This is something you want to get into. Have fun. Go do the do the tactical games if you're if you're still young enough to do it. I'm broke as shit. I can't. I can do it. But, but you, you know, go do the shooting. The US the USPSCA competition. That's fun. That's a. Comp I, I think fun. there's yeah. I think there's tremendous opportunity in and around the 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 professional shooting experience, whether it's IDPA, IPSC, all the different. And I don't want to leave any out. All the different leagues out there to not only gain exposure, but also create an experience. But if you look at a lot of things that hurt it, not having the score on the screen, not having the ability to have that confessional experience after yeah. each round and have somebody kind of do a debrief and talk you through it, like you'd see on shows like Real World or you'd see on yeah. like Road Rules. They have to create the drama. The drama is what drives the engine. NFL had a huge quantum leap when it was able to put the score on the score. board and the yeah. down and distance. So I think those sports need to take a hard look inside, but you have to look at the industry as a whole. They don't value media. Even the leadership does not truly value media. You've been around this industry, yeah. Chris. Walk yeah. around. They want to say, hey, Chris, we'll send you a knife. And you're like, send me a knife? 
How's that going? You know, I got a studio. We were just talking about this, too, before we had you on. That is the, the, I, I say it all the time to the owners. You're crazy. Because they yeah. have no idea what anything costs. They have no idea what it, what it costs to put a production together. And they don't want to learn, which creates part of the problem. Yeah. But there's a huge disconnect between the 40, 30, 20-somethings in the industry and the 60-year-olds. The 60-year-olds right. have no idea what an NFT is. They have no idea what streaming is. They have no idea that there's a kid somewhere that's opening presents that's making $17 million. A yeah. year. They have no idea that any of this exists. They live in a bubble. Now, guys are starting to get it. And if you see people like Tom Taylor, they're starting sure. to use the language and they're starting to understand it. And there is, you know, one of the things when I started the podcast I wanted to have was an opportunity to have a conversation in front of a gun wall that had nothing to do with guns because every yeah. owner was like, you got to put the gun on the table and you have to talk about everything in it. Chris, you've been around this game yeah. a long time. The AR-15 technology has not changed. There's, it's not changed an, an inch. Nothing you walk at around all. this industry and everybody's like, look at this rail. It's the latest. <laughs> it's so it, it, Chris, you have no idea this rail is going to take you home tonight and buy you dinner. And you're like, oh, that's great. You know, they, I get it. They're engineers, and that's their baby. We totally get it. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to understand, for me to market this as your baby and for me to make you king shit in the industry, I have to take this and I have to make it sexy to my audience and yeah. to everybody around me. And to do that, it's going to cost X. And they're like, whoa, wait, oh. And, yeah, you know? yeah. and you're like, well, what do you want to do here? And, you know, I think the industry is at a crossroads, and I think we're going to see some change come in as some of these younger executives and marketing directors start to ratchet up. But I don't have to tell you, Chris, you'd go into some of these meetings yeah. and you'd sit down with the owners and you'd say, you know, where's your largest audience? And they'd say social media. And they say, who manages the social media? And uh, their little nephew would walk in who was 12 years old. And they're like, <laughs> oh, it's little little Todd. And you're like, what What are you talking about? That makes no sense. Yeah. This audience yeah. gets the youngest and lowest paid on the totem pole and you value his opinion the least. It, it, I, no I think, sense in any business. I, I think we've kind of as... as I, I hate, I'm not an influencer. I, I will punch anybody in the face that calls me an influencer. <laughs> I fucking hate that. But I, I think we've, we've done it to ourselves a little bit. I, I think yeah. some of us out there, uh, now I know when I first came in, I was getting paid to be at a brand ambassador. I was one of the few that was getting paid there. I didn't realize that I, that wasn't the norm. I thought, well, wait a second. These guys have served, they right. fought for their country. They've been busting their ass. Nobody's getting paid. Because everybody wanted to get paid with the right. knife or wanted to get paid with a gun. And over time, we have done that to ourselves that we are willing to get paid with stuff. I, it was like, Dare, if you ever, I, I'm a big Marvel comic. I am. I'm a geek. I'm like Daredevil. I, we're getting paid with fluke. I'm getting paid with food and fish and shit like that. It's like, wait a second. No. It's, hey, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Man. But we and we more influencers come out there and are willing to take stuff from companies instead of actually getting paid is where we are having issues with the influencers in the industry. They, every one of them, if you're ever representing a gun company, you should be getting paid something. And for gun companies to not do that is horseshit, especially with the amount of money they're making right now. They're oh, yeah. over fist money. And, and they're not and paying if I could, people. If I could just throw something out there too, and it's not just to like say how great Chris is because I work with him and everything. But I think the reason someone like Chris is so valued is because not only are you a special operations veteran, which we were talking about before and how companies use special ops veterans, but it's like you are a regular gun instructor who does this on a regular basis and not only trains police officers in some cases, law enforcement officers, but a, a lot of your primary like demo are civilians. You just sure. want to learn the basic stuff. So like you kind of get this from all angles, I feel like. Uh, no, I, I, I do. I, I really, because I, I want to get it from, I, and that sounded kind of weird. I want to get it from all angles. <laughs> but, but but you, you do want to, except I, I wanted this to be a sport. I didn't want to be this to be a big intimidation or look at me. I can shoot a gun. I'm the coolest guy in the world. No, it's, it's come on. Let's, let's learn everybody. Let's have fun. Let's enjoy it. Let's smile. We don't have to have the chip on our shoulder. And, but Again, I think we kill ourselves a lot, John. In this industry, we, we screw ourselves a lot, and it screws everybody else down the line. I agree with what you're saying. I think we 100% do it ourselves, but I think brands are recognizing it. And a lot of okay. the brands I work with, right on, Volkortsen, Enforce, Pulsar, sure. they all get it. There are long conversations had. We discuss it at length. 
And I think a lot of it has to do with, in the beginning, a lot of the stars of the industry were naive and didn't understand really what was going on. No, I, I agree. I was. I was and, completely. Heck yeah. And look, I've said it a hundred times, Chris. I don't think, I think there's tremendous opportunity in all these different avenues, whether it's tactical games, professional shooting, all these different avenues. But I think the industry has to realize too, if we don't have a Michael Jordan or a Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, it's hard for us to become a league and become yeah. nationally recognized. We need to start to stand on the shoulders of giants. We need to start to prop each other up and we have to stop begging for the scraps. We have people like yeah. Valentina Shevchenko, that's a UFC champion in a movie with Halle Berry, you know, and she loves shooting. She loves so many, shooting. by the way, so many of these UFC guys do. And I know you yeah. know that whole world being in Vegas, like, our first guest was Andre Arlovsky. I think yep. Andre's a great Andre Arlovsky. Andre's a tremendous, and he just went and he just attended one of my buddy Marine buddies courses in Florida just last week. He still loves shooting. He's I tremendous. was outside a bathroom with Andre uh, at the <laughs> last UFC, and it was the weirdest scene. It was like me, him, Kayla Harrison, Halle Berry, and like Tommy Lee. Like it was nice. A, it was the strangest. I've been in some very strange rooms. That is strange. Place, you know? You know, I, I've had the luxury of going to a lot of weird places, and that, that's kind of what, what led to the podcast. That's, that's Vegas, though, right? Like, <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, so, I, you know, oddly enough, one of the best pictures that sits in my office is a picture of Exhibit jumping in the back. No, people, she... people saw it, and they were like, was he on the show? And I'm like, no, he just came by to hang out. So, you know. Well, I, I saw that you had some stuff. Like, is Exhibit a firearms guy? Because I think yeah. a lot Doesn't, of people. Yeah, he, actually, he's, he's shooting. Him he, and Snoop Dogg. Yeah actually both are and i think people would be surprised by this i think a lot of guys it is true it, it well, like in other industries are into this whole thing and they're well, not being shown as much like i was at shot show one year and i saw carl malone i was like i didn't know carl malone oh, he's he's a shooter. Carl Malone's a huge shoot he's a ted nugent i mean that dude it, just and like that's what he I is was, a hunting son of a Las louisiana hunter he's huge 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 we, hunter we don't embrace these guys coming into the industry as we should like, imagine a Valentina Shevchenko standing next to a Chuck Norris at a Glock booth. That would add so much star power and so much. But we get very close-minded in this industry yeah. where we're like, you brought it up earlier, Ted Nugent. Now, who doesn't love Ted Nugent? But he's 100, and who remembers anything he's ever sung? <laughs> can you name – Chris, can you name one song beyond Oh, that? you got cat, cat, cat Scratch Fever. That's it. That's I'm what gonna, I remember. Gonna, you can't disrespect love, Nugent's catalog, though. Nugent I does love, have a great catalog. Yeah, I love Ted, and I think – he he's a beacon, but give him some help. Give no, him you're some right. Support. Well, you, no, but there's other, and there are other young guys because we've had on the show, you know, Phil Labonte from All That Remains, who also owns yeah, his own drinking. gun store, yeah. big Second Amendment guy. So I think that stuff is happening. I think one of the big problems is, and you're talking about the whole social media thing, and the reason these companies need together and podcasts like ours need to come together is because we're all like a tiny group of people fighting this giant system. I even see it from what we do. I mean, like our show really doesn't get political. We don't, I don't think we're that controversial of a show, no. but then I'll go on Instagram or something and I'll notice that we'll put up just an ad for Fort Scott munitions and we'll get flagged for selling firearms. And it's like, Prison. we're not selling firearms. And then yeah. all of a sudden you notice like your reach drops and everything drops and like we're fighting this entire system. So we really do need to come together as just anyone who supports the second amendment and, and support each other. I think we're a great industry. I think guys like Chris and yourself are great people lead with the people and let the product speak for itself. Yeah. When you tune into a Pepsi commercial, you see Britney Spears dancing around on a stage and then it cuts to a scene of someone drinking a Pepsi lead with the people and the owners have to get out of their head that everything yeah. has to be, you know, a QVC commercial, like, hey, look at this. You know, we, we put the mag release right here this year, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> like, why wouldn't you? I mean, we, put it, we moved it from here to here. Game changer. I, know, like, like, I don't think that they understand operationally. Do you think, though, done. again, it comes down to money? I still yeah. think it comes down to where they're, they are the daddy war bucks. They cannot let go of that million, even though they've got five gazillion over here. I can't, we can't do that. Hey, well, we've been doing this for free forever. Let's keep doing it. For, it's if it's like, not broken, don't fix it sort of thing. It's like the ammo crisis, okay, is a great example of that, okay? Everybody knows what happened with the ammo situation. But you have people like Colleen Noir that don't have any idea what they're talking about. And they yeah. go on specials and they walk around, you know, facilities and they say hunters caused the shortage or preppers. We have enough ammunition manufacturing to outfit an entire army. And if people think. <laughs> 
for one second yeah. that the shortage was due to that. We all know what it was. Sig Sauer drove up the bid on Vista, created a quagmire, and Vista shut down its components, giving it to smaller ammo companies it's like the one you're working with, Chris. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly yeah. what went on. Along the way, they all incrementally, federal, Winchester, everybody raised prices. So prices, what do you think yeah. Sig's going to do? They're going to double down and come back with cheaper ammo, and they're going to flood the market with cheap ammo and try to gobble market share. It's money. It's, that's what drives that's, it. That's guys like John that need to be out there. I can't talk as eloquently about on the business side, <laughs> but you hit the nail on it. I mean, you're, you're right on it. You're, you're like, hey, it, it was it was business that did it. And what can we do to stop that? Well, maybe that's something we can talk about right now. Are the is the ammo companies are they ever going to get caught back up? I think we're definitely in a new normal of ammo manufacturing. From what everybody's been telling me and the feedback I've getting, been getting from people in the industry. I think people have to understand what their manufacturing capability needs to be. They obviously can't rely on primers from Vista yeah. or from yeah. some of the, yeah. because I have a simple question. If people think I'm lying about the ammo situation or I'm making this up or just trying no. to stop. No, you're not. I would gladly ask Vista or any of the brands affiliated with it. How many primers did you sell in 2019 versus 2020 as OEM? What's why the difference? We both know it was less, but why the difference? And there you're going to get your answer. So, Everybody's starting to bring primers in house. Do I think it'll come back and there'll be mid and lower players? There has to be always to balance out ammo prices, but the ammo prices are high now because they can make them high and sure. they can control yeah. the market. So you have smaller players like Hornady, but you know, you're still going to have them. And Hornady is a huge player. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but yeah, in yeah. the scheme of things relative to Winchester, Remington and everything else. And you have yeah, to look yeah. at those types of deals. I mean, there's hundreds of millions of dollars wrapped up in them and so many brands to spin off. I thought Marlin was the crown jewel of that, but uh, you know, it ended up working out where the ammo became valuable due to the circumstances. So. Well, and, and that's, that's where I, again, I agree with you. I, I maybe come back maybe it'll even out. I, I'm happy with who I'm with. I, we love Fort Scott and they're a tremendous spot. They're, this, that is one company though, that actually has put their money where their mouth is. They, they haven't just, Yes, they gave me a, a good chunk. They gave me a lot of ammo to teach with, but they also they also sponsor our podcast. So it's one of the few companies that we've been around that, and they sponsor sponsors what now for two years, Ian? Yeah, th since that, we started, that is actually 11, 11, uh, 2019. one of our main spot. That is not only hey, give me ammo to use, which you know that's like giving you fifty cent pieces nowadays. But they also they also pay. They also say hey here, and and I'll say yeah, they do pay for our podcast yeah. and they sponsor it and. Why should I mean, we're helping them? They're helping us. Isn't that how it's supposed to be? Isn't well, that how what I come back to you guys is, is production value, right? To anybody out there that's listening and saying, oh, we want millions of dollars. Listen, you're not going to make millions of dollars in the gun industry. I'll dispel that rumor right yeah. now. Yeah. It's not going to happen. But there is a real cost in what we're trying to do by doing things like podcasting, doing things like streaming that all have an inherent cost. Microphones cost money. Computers cost yeah. money. We're trying to up the production value of the industry, and we're trying to take the industry with us. The NSSF and NRA uh, and all the different orgs stopped valuing that and stopped placing a value on that. We saw NRA TV go by the wayside through Ackerman McQueen. Yeah, yeah, shit. So we were left with nothing. So, you know, we're kind of picking up the pieces as the as the civilians in this case, not necessarily working in the industry anymore, even though we do consult in a roundabout way. We're stuck picking up the pieces to enhance that media experience for everybody that wants to be exposed to it and build and generate an audience for these brands because they don't place as much of a value on it to bring it in house, though they are. They're starting to now because they're starting to get it. And I've said it a hundred times. If the NRA or NSSF wanted the show or wanted to air it on one of their streaming, I'd give it to them for free. It's not a question. They haven't even called. They haven't even written. I've had some of the most powerful people in any industry on this yeah. show. Yeah. And I've had one of them reach out to ask for a clip or to even bother. I've offered to give free memberships to all the people that come on the show. I've not got a response. Wow. It's kind of, you know, it's wow. interesting that you say that because I do notice that with us too, in that um, like, so I yeah. previously started a podcast with my friend, Brandon, who's still doing appetite for distortion, which is, yeah. it was centered around guns and roses and rock music and that type of stuff. It. But like, but so he recently had Dave Navarro on and Dave Navarro spoke about how he would have been in Guns N' Roses if not for his drug issues. And it was a great clip. And it got passed around to all these rock sites, Blabbermouth, Yahoo News. And I don't see stuff getting picked up from shows like ours as much. There's like a rock community that supports each other. 
And yeah, it is true. You would think the NRA would run clips of someone like you. They do do stuff with, as you mentioned, Colian Noir and stuff. And I like, I like his stuff. Right. I don't know but, if you, if but you know, he, but... I think, I think Colian though, he's actually a paid NR. He's, he's, he's an employee. Would he be, would he say an employee? He's an employee. He and Dana Loesch were considered spokespeople of the NRA. Okay. I think they kept Dana on in some capacity as like special assistant to somebody. I've never seen Dana Loesch shoot a gun. I've never, I never have either. No. In a photo. I've never seen anything, and I challenge if anyone can find a photo or a picture of her shooting a gun, I'll give them a hundred bucks PayPal right now. <laughs> All right, well, he said it on the show. A single verification that I, I think some people become created superstars in the industry, which yeah. is so interesting to me, Chris, because you were at the tip of the spear, the mouth of the fucking river. And you've seen it all. And I have the most respect for that. Thank you, bro. And we're in such a cockstrong industry that we anoint these widgets. It, it's insane. I, you know, and it, it, it's, it's not, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't offend me at all. I believe I, and I appreciate you saying that dude. Uh, but you know, you, you do, you have guys out there that, that, I mean, you got guys like Jack Carr, you got guys like Pat Mack, you know, who's, you got guys like Vickers and, you know, Larry Vickers that was freaking Delta and, and you got guys like Paul Howe out there that, I mean, come on, he was, he was freaking Black Hawk Down hero. Um, and none of them, I mean, I, I don't know if they're out there as much as you would. You're right. Like a Colin or, or a, or a oh. Dana, Dana Loesch. And why? Not that they're not, I know both of them. And I've been on Dana. She's a, she's the nicest person in the world. Not to say anything bad about her, her, her character, but why? And Chris, where I'll did that come from? Why not somebody that actually cashed a check in the industry I, I know. <laughs> for, for such for such an industry that's so dependent on how legitimate you are yeah i actually worked in the business cashed a check had employees where you know so that doesn't make that any doesn't, sense that doesn't make any fucking sense and none. so it pisses me off it's actually why I, I i'm not a big fan of the nra I'm a member and I'm a lifetime member. And I think we I, all I, are. Sure, yeah. we all, I, I, that's what kills me too, is all of us, even though, even though that is probably one of the most pompous organizations, in my opinion. Well, it's very in, in the world. It's a very it, There you go. But, but, but we still show loyalty to it because of the second amendment, not because of the NRA, but because we believe in the second amendment. We still, as a group know that this is still probably one of the best protections to keep our second amendment rights is to be part of a, inbred pompous organization that really shits on the people that that they shouldn't it's also it's also all you really have because you have like super PACs run by like one of the richest men in the world michael bloomberg you know trying to fight that and so like you need i hate super PACs in general but it's like you need a super PAC to fight these multi multi multi-billionaires who are going to do everything to tear down the second amendment i'll say this ian there's there's throwing good money after bad and then there's stepping over twenties to make pennies and then there's being smart. So Neil Curry and I at ready gunner had a conversation once about this. Neil's a friend. I love him. Neil, Neil's a, Neil's say, Hey, he's second ranger bet. Neil and his right. tremendous. Neil's a, Neil's a good, he's a, he's one of the anomaly rangers that is actually really big. Neil, Neil's awesome. Neil's and his wife are, they're tremendous individuals. Yeah. He and I have discussed this at length. I think there's an over politicization of the firearms. We have a lot of Democrats that now own firearms that have come into the fold now, and we don't do a great job of embracing them. We want to club them over the head. We want to hit them with the, with the right wing stuff right away. Yeah. How about this? Like, I would love to go to NRA show and I'd love to see a guy like Bo Jackson speak. Who's an avid hunter and Auburn guy who loves all that stuff. I'd love to see some different and unique steps in the community. I want to see the community grow. We all want to see it expand. The NRA and NSSF and all these entities are the entities we were handed. When I say they're inbred, you know, Jason, we met a very good friend of mine. He's the head of NRA Isla. He's a great guy. He's, I'm trying to get him out here go, to go to a fight. And, go to the, and I'm just trying to reason with them. I'm begging them. Hey, you know, support shows like yours, yeah. support shows like mine. We'll give guests free memberships, whatever we can do. But yeah. if you don't use us, we can't help you. We're, we're, we're a gun that's loaded on the wall, your best option, and you don't want to pick it up and use it. And you yeah. you don't want, you still want to grab that old musket and grab that musket. Hey, I'm going to use this old fucking musket. They're, they're, they're look around for Ted Nugent. That was John Bartolo, who is absolutely unfiltered as you could hear uh if you want to dig back in the archives for that full interview it was a good one uh episode 115 we miss you john 
And uh, this last interview we're going to get to, this is an excerpt with Vincent Speranza, World War II veteran. Amazing to have him on. Probably the last interview he ever did. What an honor. This is from episode 179. This is Vincent getting into World War II training and war stories. You're on the bus and you're all bragging to each other. Oh boy, I can't wait till I get to that bitch. We get off the bus. This big sergeant comes out. Line up! Best we could. A bunch of kids, you know, we we probably were going to form a circle. But he said, my name is Masterelli. You got it? Yes, sir. Don't give me that, sir, shit. Save that for the officers. I'm a sergeant, and the name is Sergeant Masterelli. Understand? You got it? Yes, sir, sergeant. All right. Now, I got 19 weeks to turn you little sh- uh, students. Say whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> it's it out. Soldiers. And by God, Master Relly is going to do it. You got it? Now, we're all crapping in our pants now. <laughs> this guy's scaring the hell out of us. He said, All you got to remember this. When Master Relly says jump, you just say, How high and how far? You got it? Yes, sir. Now get in those barracks and come out looking like soldiers. That was the beginning. And we gobbled it up. We loved it. We just couldn't wait for each each morning to get out and get that training. And uh, 19 weeks later, we were just beside ourselves. All right, man, we're going to get into the fight. And and uh, we had been taught, uh, you know, how to do a lot of things uh, to uh, end somebody's life, and uh, with the weapons we had. But it was just uh, the M1 rifle, an infantryman. That's all he had to know. We we're ready to get into the fight. No, you got to come back for four more weeks of advanced infantry advanced. training. Yeah. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Now we go back, you know, advanced infantry training, more ways of how to kill somebody with hand to hand combat and knives <laughs> and like that. All right, now we're getting in the fight, right? No, you got to come back for two more weeks of heavy weapons training. <laughs> heavy weapons, you know, 60 millimeter mortars and, and, and 50 cal machine guns. All right, for God's sake, you can go back for the two weeks for the, for the heavy weapons training. No, right? No, you have to be assigned to a line outfit. Hmm. Oh, I was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, the 87th Infantry Division. So as, as a graduate of the infantry school. Now, now we're going to get into the war. Maneuvers in Tennessee, uh, jungle training in Florida. Florida. When the hell are we going to get into this war? <laughs> One day, they took us out to a big field, and they said, uh, going to be a demonstration today. And we said, what kind of demonstration? Said, Shut up and sit down. So we sit down. Three C-47s come out of the sky. They circle the field, and then we see the doors open, and guys throw themselves out of the door with a little white thing that takes them to the ground. You know, patches were brand new in World War II. <clears throat> and, and you see these guys land, roll up their parachutes, and double time and stand in front of us in line. Big, beautiful guys with shiny silver wings and uh, shiny jump boots with the pants, blouse, only paratroops were allowed to do that in World War II. Blouse and pants and boots. And the lieutenant called I said, this is the United States Parachute Corps, and we're looking for a few good men. You uh, got to have had your 19 weeks, your four weeks, and your two weeks. Uh, who wants to volunteer? And we went, whoa, hey, but wait a minute. Throw yourself out of an airplane? <laughs> he said, and there's 50 bucks extra money to jump pay. 
<laughs> they took seven of us back to Fort Benning, only this time to the parachute school. Now, I, I, I can't believe how happy, thrilled we were to get that parachute. What train? The, 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 we had the best damn officers in the world, but most of the trainers were uh, buck sergeants. A lot of them had just come out of the, the, the Normandy there. They, they had combat experience and so on. And we just gobbled it up. You know, in infantry, 30 mile hikes, in the patrols, we did 50 mile hikes uh, with full field equipment wow. and so on and so on. And then uh, in the infantry, you walk every place in the patrols, you run every place. And and the the they built, you know, for every little infraction was the push ups. Uh, time for inspection. Look at the speck on your <laughs> rifle. Give me 50 push ups for having a 30 rifle. <laughs> you rolled your eyeballs at me when you were supposed to be at attention. Give me 50 push ups for being rolling your eyes. Friends, where are you from? New York. What a lousy state. Give me 50 push-ups for being from New York. <laughs> <laughs> but they they really, they really built us. My God, by the time we got out of jump school, we were ready to take on the whole damn German army by ourselves. The confidence they built in us and, and the, the training, the physical training and so on. And of course, uh, it's five-week course. Yeah. Uh, the first four weeks is all getting ready for. Then the fifth week, you you make you got to make your five jumps, uh, four daytime and one night time. And that's the week, you know, where <laughs> you separate the men from the boys. <clears throat> the first four weeks were uh, all morning is it's a physical training. And in the afternoons, all different kinds of, they have a few slides there teaching you how to jump, how to, you know, how to kick legs and this. And, uh, and the fourth week was parachute packing. And we said, what the hell for? They said, you are going to make your first jump out of a parachute. You pack yourself. <laughs> Man, you never saw a more attentive class in your whole life. And the worst of it was, you packed your parachute on Friday. The jump is not till Monday. And you got all weekend. Holy crap, did I do it right? I got to do Sergeant Kelly, no, that's done. Whatever. Are, are, you able to, are you able to sleep knowing that you're going to do that for the first time and, and you have to wait that whole weekend? No, but then we were supervised when we were doing it. You know, the, the jump masters were there. They're, they're not really going to let recruits loose on set back in the yeah but parachute. i just i just mean the nervousness of your head hitting the pillow going like wow Monday well, well that's the plane. point that, you know yeah. and, and your your worry is you got the whole damn weekend to worry about what you're gonna do on monday yeah but um you know they they made sure we did it right well, at least in my class, nobody's parachute failed. That's what I was going to say. Did, it, did anybody he, fail? But everybody, everybody jumped out. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe some other classes, not in my class. <laughs> we, we all did. Uh, but no, but we did have a terrible accident in that. Um, at Fort Benning, the, the, on one end, which is the Chattahoochee River. Yeah, yeah. You, it's, it's your, you and, jump on Friar, Friar Drop Zone. I've jumped there, too. It's, you get the chat. It, did you have somebody float into the river? Like, Because we've had guys. No, no, no. <laughs> what happened was the night jump, a very bright moonlit night. Wow. And uh, the concrete highway that goes along that looked like water to some of the guys. Oh. And when they jumped, well, now when you're taught, if you're going to land in the water, release your chute, Shoot. hang on with just your hand, and about six feet above the water, let go of the chute so it doesn't drown you. And uh, these guys, and at night, you know how hard it is oh, to, yeah. to uh, judge the distance. They were way above that damn concrete. They let go and they splattered themselves. Oh, wow. And, uh, the, the whole class went crazy, but you couldn't, hey, we were going to graduate the next morning and get our wings, 
So yeah, sorry for the tragedy, but uh, yeah. nothing, nothing's gonna keep me from being one happy camper tomorrow morning when they congratulate me and, and, and put pin to the wings on that said, you are a paratrooper. Wow. Now, the, just for a moment on, on, on the jump, uh, you know, one of the things that makes uh, airborne soldiers a little special, let's say, <laughs> is that they face the moment of truth. Yeah. When you go out that door, only one or two things can happen. You're going to have a nice open parachute that takes you to the ground, or you're going to smash yourself into a million pieces. <laughs> when, if you're willing to do that and then do it four more times, uh, that's, uh, combat is a lot easier to take because hey, you've already faced uh, <laughs> a kind of uh, situation. Uh, on, the, on the first jump, by the way, I, I, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't do it yet. I was a virgin <laughs> when, when, when we were the first jump. Uh, the sun says, all right, the smoking lamp is lit. And I see all these guys like a cigarette, you know. And I see them. <clears throat> Give me one of that. <laughs> they seem to be helping them. <laughs> they gave me a cigarette. And I lit it. And I didn't even know how to smoke. And I, told, <laughs> and I start coughing and spitting. And blah, 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 blah. Stand up. Ooh, hook up. Hook up. <laughs> and 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 the the sensation, you know, your jumpers yourself never leaves you. It's always the same. It's always the most thrilling damn thing in your life. You go out that damn door and then do it. You don't, you don't have to do anything. A parachute opens above you and you slide down to the, you know, and, and you look down and, and, and oh, it's just a beautiful thing. And in, in my day, you, you know, you, you jumped and uh, the propeller blast opened the chute and you just slide under it. It, it was wow. a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. You know, there's a 30 foot uh, static line, and the parachute itself is 32 feet long before it opens. So you're, you're down at an angle from the plane, 60 feet, the prop blast hits it, and it opens the chute, and you just slide under it. It's mag magnificent. magnificent. Wow. When I got on the ground, and, and by the way, the, the, the training kicks in. Just before you get to the ground, you know, you're enjoying the jump. It's, everything's quiet, beautiful. And then you look, oh, Christ, the ground's coming up fast. And uh, you're trying you know, to put your yep. knees, you know, knees no, to no, no, no. And I had a perfect landing, absolutely no problem. And I laid there and I looked up and I said, Miranda, <laughs> you didn't shit your pants or piss on your boots. <laughs> you're a paratrooper. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, wait a minute, you got to do this four more times. Stop congratulating yourself until you make the fifth one. But at any rate, all my jumps were absolutely beautiful. I had absolutely nice. no problem. If you pay attention to the teacher, you know, everything goes right. Some of the guys, you know, like they would dive instead of jumping sideways. <laughs> And and uh, they're they're upside yeah. down when the chute <laughs> opens, and my God, they get jerked all the way up. And so on. and uh, one guy had a May West, but uh, it wasn't bad. He he had time to open up his uh, emergency chute. At any rate, we graduated, and um, in the pilot groups, no fooling around. As soon as you graduate, you get a, a furlough home for a week. When you come back, you're shipped out. <laughs> Fortunately, my class, you know, at that time they were alternating. This class goes to Europe, this class goes to the Pacific, this class in Europe. And uh, mine, thank God, because, you know, I was a city boy. Uh, all I could think of was, my God, you're going to go fight in the goddamn jungle. Besides the enemy, there's snakes and turtles and all kinds <laughs> of poisonous stuff. I, I just blessed my stars when they said, uh, you're going to New York. You know? And and so uh, we, they put us on a train. 
Where do we go? Camp Shanks again, right outside of my home there in New York. Now, during the, uh, the training there at Fort Benning, every once in a while, the army would give us for lunch or dinner what they called spaghetti. Um, <laughs> those, those of us who were, uh, you know, uh, uh, let, let's say a, a, a little bit uh, conscious of what real spaghetti is supposed to be like, yeah, would yeah. make no, trays and make noses and faces and so on. But hey, that's all it was to eat. You had to eat it. I used to say to the guys, you call this crap spaghetti. If we ever get anywhere near my mother's house, I'll take it and let you taste some real spaghetti. <laughs> so here we are now at Camp Upton before we go overseas. All right, Speranza, what about you going to take us to your mother's house with spaghetti? I said, well, uh, yeah, okay, uh, let me call my mother. So I called my mother. I said, listen, Mom, I... Uh, I got a day pass. So we're going to be come, come home, and uh, but, but then I have to go back. And and uh, oh, Vinny, that's great! Oh, I'll make you a nice dinner. So I said, yeah. And I said, well, listen, you know, when I was at Fort Benning and talking to the guys, you should see what the army gave us that they called spaghetti. I told them if we're ever near New York, uh, I would bring them. She said, sure, sure, bring them. How many? I said, eighteen. She said, 18. <laughs> you know, my whole stick. Uh, yep. 18 minutes of stick on each side. She said, uh, how much time? Do I? I said, well, we won't be there for at least three or four hours. She, oh, she said, don't worry. By the way, my mother was a tough Sicilian woman. You don't scare her with anything. <laughs> 18 guys, sure. Okay. And the, the neighborhood going crazy. Three cars pull up outside and a whole bunch of paratroopers running. You know, my mother's house was small, modest house. When we got there, she had the thing set up so that there was a place for 20 people. My sisters were all going bananas, all these nice guys, you know, young. Uh, <laughs> and, and you should see the service we got. Uh, even the li even the little kid, the, the little girl, and, and whatever the story was, she had it ready for the dinner. Now, before we sat down to dinner, my wife pulled, my mother pulled me aside. She said, listen, Vinny. she said, you know, when they were, we, have, we have spaghetti, we have wine, but uh, you kids are all under the drinking age at that time was 21. What am I going to do about the wine? I said, hey, we're going to fight for the country. Yeah, put the wine out too. And so, consequently, there was a pitcher of wine at each table. Consequently, by the end of the meal, a lot of guys were feeling very good. And uh, <laughs> we decided to put on a demonstration jump out my mother's window. <laughs> <laughs> the, the neighborhood went crazy. We, <laughs> you know, the living room window was about like maybe four feet from the ground. And then uh, I jumped out, Geronimo! Geronimo <laughs> back in the house. And we, we had something to talk about. It was fun. And uh, right after that, we were on the Queen Mary and uh, overseas. Now, in uh, the Queen Mary had the the only place it can dock in England is um, uh, Southampton, but the, the Germans were in control of the channel then, so she we didn't dock in Southampton. We docked off the coast of Scotland. And then they, with smaller boats, they took us ashore, put us on the train down to England. A uh, place called Hungerford, and uh, just uh, they didn't even try to make us train. They, they, you know, there were no facilities there; just a bunch of Quonset huts. Uh, at any rate, uh, the day finally came when they flew us into France. It's December now, and uh, I was sent to a place called. Uh, Camp Montmelon, where the 101st Airborne Division had just been sent. Now, you, you have to know a little bit about what the situation was there. 
the hundred first Airborne Division in the you know it made a name for itself in Normandy. Fantastic. And and the 501, especially the attached outfit, my outfit, uh, got the presidential unit citation for its right now. Only the 501. And and <clears throat> Uh, in the market garden operation, everybody took a beating. But people don't admit it, but that was the biggest failure around. The Germans almost captured uh, two whole divisions, the 101st and the 82nd. What happened was, Montgomery, by the way, his plan, uh, you know how Patton felt about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, What the, what the British and the Canadians were doing would go up the coast because the, uh, the launchers for the V-2 rockets were on the coast there and Britain was getting a, beaten all over again with those V-2 rockets. So they, they were separated and, and uh, the American armies were in the south and, and uh, in, uh, in Holland there they took a beating. They had to leave. Uh, they lost three thousand men out of the twelve thousand uh, division, and and uh, <clears throat> they were supposed to. They were brought back now to uh, the, the the problem was the the paratroopers did their job. They took the bridges across the Rhine there and held them. Then now armor, British uh, armor, was supposed to come up. Come- and and re- relieve the paratroopers, you know. Best thing we've got is mortars and machine guns, and that's yeah. all. Well, the the plan, the stupidity, I can't believe it. There was only one road that the armor was supposed to come up. The Germans recovered quickly. They cut the road. Cut no them. no yeah. armor. And the paratroopers get left out there to get their asses kicked. And, and boy, did they. Both the 82nd and 101st. There was a Polish brigade there, almost wiped out uh, the Canadians, and uh, it, was, it was just a disaster. And uh, they pulled us out just before the, the Germans were uh, going to attack in the south and trap the 101st and the 82nd. But uh, we did, we got out, both, both divisions, but uh, beat up. A lot of men lost and. and leave a lot of their equipment, all the, the food that a division is supposed to have, and this and this and this. And uh, back in uh, Mormelon there in northern France is where the 101st was sent to recuperate. It was supposed to get 90 days of rest, rehabilitation, replacements like me, and and uh, uh, equipment and... and uh, it was not to be. December the 16th, nobody knew it. Neither the, the British intelligence, American intelligence. Uh, somebody was asleep at the switch. Everybody believes, you know, when the time uh, wars wind down, you can't fight in the snow and ice. Uh, you're not supposed to anyway. And, and, um, our division commander, uh, Maxwell Taylor, was in the States making speeches. Uh, the assistant, uh, the deputy commander was in England making speeches. The only general on the base was McAuliffe, the artillery commander. Well, nobody knew that Hitler had saved up 25 divisions, gathered some from the Eastern Front, but, but he had put together 25 divisions, nine of them were panzer divisions with their newest tanks, the Mark IVs, the Tiger Royals, and so on. And on December 16th, he hit uh, in the Ardennes. The plan was to go from Germany across Belgium to Antwerp, where, which was yeah, our yeah. port of entry, all our supplies, equipment, and so on, so on, gasoline. Their plan was to capture Antwerp, deny us the supplies, of course, and have the gasoline that they needed for themselves. And it would have separated the British and Canadian armies in the north from the American armies. And the southern changed the war. It would have. 
and uh, you know, everybody called this, you know, Hitler's last attempt uh, less, uh, to, to pull a victory out of the war. Their problem was to get from Germany to Antwerp, they had to funnel through the Ardennes and the tanks had to stay on the roads because of the terrain and, 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 the, and the weather. And uh, when these, there were four American divisions holding the Ardennes line. And on December 16th, when the Joint Aid destroyed those four divisions, they were no longer fighting units. They couldn't even retreat when they wanted to. The German Blitzkrieg was on the top of them before they could do anything. And uh, the morning before that, you know, while we're still back in camp, None of us know anything that's going on. You know, I was enlisted man. Maybe the officers, I don't think the officers knew anything either. All of a sudden, they get a call. And as far as, far as we're concerned, all we know is that the barrack lights come on. And the sergeant says, uh, hey, drop your, and grab your socks. We're, we're, we're moving up. <laughs> <coughs> We said, you're crazy. The ground is frozen. We'll all break our legs. He said, you're not jumping. You're going up in trucks. Hmm. And all I could think of was, oh, my air going crazy. All my jumps are, I'm going to make my first <laughs> jump off the back of a truck. <laughs> but at any rate, for the moment he said that, was all, I was in a machine gun. You know, without a machine gun. I had a trench knife in my boot. So I don't have a helmet. I don't have a, I don't have a rifle. I don't have this. We didn't have. Later on, they told us what the figure was. Ten percent of us were unarmed. Wow. Hmm. We went to Bastogne unarmed. You know, all day and all night in the trucks. I I I, I describe it better in the book about the uh, the dangers of. Um, uh, attempted hygiene in a moving truck and uh, what happens to uh, uh, you know there were no stops at any rate uh, we were we were told uh, stop bitching make a list uh, and we'll stop along the way and get what you need and we believed it oh yeah okay so i took a piece of paper and i need a nice light 30 machine gun i need at least eight or nine tins of ammo and <laughs> we need gloves and hats and you know we only had summer clothes and uh, combat boots and you know uh, don't make me laugh about stopping and getting what you need there were no stops and by the time we got to Bastogne, we were madder at each other than we were at the Germans from the, <laughs> the horrible situation of uh, uh, pissing in your helmet and trying to get it across the truck and spilled all over the guys and the guys on the edge and, yeah. go out and the wind blows it back on the, on the <laughs> head. And uh, some of the guys who couldn't hold, hold the other thing there, uh, you know, it was really a, a messy thing. But the miracle, they moved a whole damn division, 130 miles, in a day and a night, got there one day before the Germans. It, it made all the difference in the world for that battle that, that uh, we had time to uh, deploy and uh, dig in, you know. Uh, but what we get well, the best done. And hey, Vincent, said, Vincent, how did you, or for, for, how did you get the weapons that you needed? And then how did you do it? Okay, I'm and di and digging in too on frozen ground. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you. Okay, we uh, uh, we get to Bastogne, get off the trucks, just happy to get the hell off that crowded sardine truck. And and they said, uh, "All right, fix bayonets, five yards apart, and watch out for snipers." I pulled the knife out of it. I said, well, tell me, what the hell am I supposed to do here? I'm going to fight with a, with a trench knife? And the other guy said, hey, I don't have this, I don't have that. Like I said, later they told us what the figure was. 10% of us were, were in Bastogne, so, so ready to fight. We're without weapons. 
what saved us was the stragglers from those four divisions that got smashed were ordered to the rear through Baston. They had to go through Baston. So here these guys were, you know, there's a big mess in that town now. The people trying to leave and us trying to get in there. And we just went up to the guy and said, hey, buddy, look, you're going back. You know, you, 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 you took the rifle and right right off my shoulder. Took <coughs> the grenades and went in his pockets, took the grenades. I saw a guy with a nice light story. I said, oh, that looks so heavy, pal. Let me help you carry it. Uh, <laughs> and he had two belts of ammunition. But I also picked up a, a, an M1 either. I, I'm all weighted down. Okay, but I, I knew damn well two belts of ammunition and the machine gun, five, five, the first five minutes of a battle. And, and so I, I took a bandolier of uh, ammo from, from a guy and uh, the, uh, the fact was that by the time the Germans attacked, we were armed. Those of us that didn't have weapons did have it. the, and I, I had a nice, you know, um, with, with a bipod and, and a, the folding stock, the one that they used for the leg packs in Normandy. I don't know where the hell this guy got it, but that was lucky because, you know, we the line was thin. They, they broke up all the two-man machine gun uh, people. You got to handle it by yourself. And uh, uh, spread out. In, in other words, uh, the well, you, you can't have a three-man squad in, in paratroops. If they, when, when you jump, if one guy gets separated uh, or gets hurt or something on the way down, uh, your, your gun is useless. If, if the ammo bearer lands someplace yeah, yeah. else or if the tripod guy, you know, then you have to fire at John Winstar. But the, the story was, we got there one day before they they, they arrived, and uh, we were now armed. We armed ourselves from the stragglers uh, of, of those divisions. Now the <laughs> we, they march us to an area. All right, dig in here. Now the ground's frozen. Mm-hmm. Luckily, we had the new shovels. The kind that you yes. can bend over and tie it. Yeah, and yeah the old the e tool e tools. If we had had those uh, sandbox toys that they used to have for shovels with a little wooden handle and a thing to my gun, but uh, you know you whack the ground, it bounces back in your face, and you whack it, you whack it, you whack it. It took us like four. We dug a two man hole, a uh, machine gun, uh, even though. We knew damn well they were going to take one guy, but uh, the orders were you dig a regular machine gun hole. Well, it took us almost four hours. To get. After you get through the frozen ground, you got the, the tree roots. Yes. 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 What helped her to dig a foxhole? We were dug in them, but it was like maybe three, four o'clock in the morning. Wow. All right, we're moving out. Holy crap. <laughs> we got to dig in over there. Pick up your stuff. You curse everybody. You have that we had had no food or water since we got off the trucks. Get down the road a little bit. All right, now dig in here. Okay. Now, you know, even though you're young and strong and so on, there's only so much you can do. But yeah, we yeah. whacked away, whacked away. We got a half shallow thing there, good enough. Uh, we we flopped in the hole. Ah, we're moving out. Ah, I'll get the hell. <laughs> you got to <laughs> dig in over there. We just scraped the snow as I lay on the ground. How would it? We were exhausted. We, we couldn't do anymore. We got a little sleep, the sleep of exhaustion. Still no food and water. And uh, <clears throat> the, the the morning, this is the morning of the eighteenth. When you when the when it got daylight, there was fog all over the way. The fog was all the way down to the ground. 
you couldn't see more than like maybe 15, 20 yards all around you. And the lieutenant saying, stay, just stay quiet, stay quiet, everybody, stay quiet. And the fog starts to lift like a curtain. The whole thing like is lifting at once. And when it got up a little way, you can duck down it and see down the road. I couldn't believe it in front of me. It was an open field with the heavy woods on both sides, but like a corridor. And they were gonna, we said, they're gonna attack across it. It was cocky, man. They're going to talk, maybe they know we didn't have big machine guns, but whatever the story was, we couldn't believe that uh, they were going to attack across this open field. Now, the ground sloped from the woods where they were about, four, it was about 800 yards altogether, it sloped down about 400, and then sloped up to where we were. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they waited a while to see what, how we were dug in. But, but uh, the story was, the lieutenant said, now set your sights for 400 yards. Anybody understand? 400 yards. Okay. The fog goes a little higher. And now when it's high enough for us to see, man, the whole world went on fire. The, they later told us a shell was landing every eight seconds. And the big stuff, the, the ground shook. And then the sergeant of the hound, keep your hands down, keep your hands down, keep your hands down. We, we didn't much coaxing. Uh, uh, there was nothing you could do except pick your nose down to the bottom <laughs> of the foxhole. You curse yourself for not digging it deeper. And artillery is landing all over the place. And, uh, you know, it's the most helpless feeling in the world. You can't do anything about it. Just pray that, it's, that you don't get a direct hit. Well, that about wraps it up, guys. That was Vincent Speranza from episode 179. If you want to dig back in the archives, talking about World War II training and war stories, Rest in peace to John Bartolo, Robert Allen, and Vincent Speranza. It was an honor to host you guys on the show, and it's a pleasure to be able to honor your memories on this best of episode. Uh, if you made it through, guys, as always, leave your feedback wherever you're listening. Greatly appreciated. All that stuff attracts new listeners, and uh, we'll be back on Tuesday with more for you. That's all for this episode of Battleline Podcast. But we're always posting new content on social media. Follow us on Instagram at Battleline Podcast and on Twitter at Battleline Pod. That's an order. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes up every Tuesday. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform of choice. Believe in yourself. Face all challenges head on. And as always... Never quit.